Hello everybody, this is Peter Swidler with the highlights video of, the, of round one of the uh, Vikings Air 2017 tournament. And uh, round one uh, was a relatively quiet affair and the one game we expected to potentially provide some fireworks uh, did end up being the, the obvious choice for uh, this highlight video when we were doing our uh, predictions round uh, before the round started. I was quite confidently predicting draws in most games Apart from this one, in which I've, I've, my choice was some kind of a result, but uh, with uh, uh, White being favored, and uh, I probably should actually show you which game I'm in. It is a game uh, in which Pavel Yanov was White against uh, Richard Rapport, and uh, as you can see on your screen, uh, Pavel has a very, very good score against uh, Richard, one draw and three victories with no losses for the Ukrainian, and. Uh, uh, we thought that uh, Richard generally doesn't pull punches very much and, and, and we expected him to go for uh, the trademarked uh, rapport stuff from, from the very beginning in this tournament and he did not disappoint. So let's uh, go into the game. Pavel started with knight of 3, uh, e6, uh, already uh, a very, very uh, funky choice, so to speak, from Richard giving white. A tremendous uh, uh, breadth of opportunities here, uh, as the arrows indicate. You can make uh, either one of the three developing moves taking control of the center here. Perhaps e4 is the least likely of them, but d4 and c4 are both very, very normal. Pavel, though, continued playing at Koi, playing g3 here, c5, bishop g2, knight c6. And the move which we really felt like uh, this was a bait of some sort here, because uh, in particular for me, uh, someone who's been playing the Grunfeld my entire life and also started uh, towards the later part of my career to play uh, one knight of three very, very seriously. The, the, uh, the option of playing uh, d4 here would have been very attractive simply for the reason that uh, black has already committed to playing e6 and the way to refute d4, well, not refute, but to uh, pose problems against an early d4 in positions like this generally is connected with playing e7, e5 in one tempo. And uh, against uh, 4d4, black is actually, I think, limited to playing the Grunfeld a tempo down, which gives white a very, very comfortable position and I think decent chances for advantage even. But Pavel instead played c4, uh, allowing Richard to do exactly what Richard immediately uh, has done in reply, uh, namely uh, g7, g5, which is it looks weird, but it is actually a, a bit of a, a rapport special specialty. Uh, he really likes these uh, long fianchettos, so to speak, uh, gaining space, also creating uh, options of uh, chasing the knight away from f3. And in this particular case, I think it's, a, it's actually very, very playable. The point being that if white plays d4 straight away, uh, g4, knight d5, c takes d4, knight c6, and d c6 is a very, very strong reply, uh, and uh, white might even uh, struggle winning that pawn back. Pavel went d3, h6, it's way too early to play uh, g4, you need to wait until uh, white actually challenges the g5 pawn. Knight c3, bishop g7, and here Pavel decided to make sure that uh, his king side is, is relatively secure and there's uh, not going to be a pawn storm uh, uh, along the h file perhaps later in the game by playing h4 g4 9 d2 d6 e3. Uh, here uh, h5 is a playable move but uh, Richard is not really uh, someone who hesitates to grab more space uh, by making a more committal structural decision. So f5 knight b3 uh, a sensible plan, uh, white tries to challenge the black center as early as possible. Uh, if something like uh, a3, knight g7, rook b1, uh, I mean castles, castles, and rook b1, it's very difficult to imagine that this, this plan of uh, pushing b4 is even particularly d dangerous for black, but also black can uh, uh, s sort of stop it uh, completely by playing a5. And uh, these light pieces on uh, on uh, the, the white uh, queen side, uh, in particular the knight on d2 and the, uh, the bishop on c1, are not really doing very much here. So Pavel went knight b3, knight g7, and d4. 
at least trying to uh, challenge the uh, the black center as early as possible. But uh, b6 uh, solves these solves these issues very very comfortably here. It's a it's a move black generally wants to make. Uh, both bishop b7 and bishop a6 are very much part of uh, black's future plans. And uh, tactically, if you play g5 here, which looks attractive for about one second. Uh, Sorry, d5, yeah. Uh, this is very, very strongly replied to by bishop takes c3, bc, and knight d5. And uh, yeah, the bishop on c1 is completely dead here, and accepting the exchange sacrifice is, is suicidal, because in this position, um, yeah, white's position is, is just uh, a ruin, and he's completely lost. Because of that, uh, castles, castles has been, uh, had been played in the game, and here Pavel played queen e2. Uh, a move which we expected to happen, and we thought Queen E2 with the, uh, connected with the idea of Rook G1 is by far uh, the most critical move in this position. Uh, once again, um, trying to create threats as early as possible and uh, not give Black time to finish development and play something, for instance, like Bishop A6 and Rook C8. And Black had a number of options here. Uh, e5 is what uh, Richard uh, eventually opted for, and it's a very understandable move and a very decent move as well. But he could also play it slower, for instance, by playing a6, rook d1, queen c7. The point of the move a6 uh, being to stop knight c3, b5, and uh, secure the c7 square for the queen. This was also very, very playable. But e5 is not a poor move by, uh, by any means. It challenges the white center, and perhaps more importantly, it creates a very serious positional idea of playing e5, e4, completely locking the g2 bishop in and uh, making sure that uh, uh, white doesn't really have any active plans whatsoever. Pavel played rook d1, uh, keeping the pressure and uh, inviting uh, some trades in the center which would at least somewhat revive his bishop, uh, his bishop on c1, at least uh, hopefully. Uh, if instead you play d5, black just goes back to b8, and uh, white is stuck with a number of pieces here which don't make a, a ton of sense. Uh, e4 uh, is once again a potential problem, and if you play e4 yourself after f4, you really are in a, in a world of trouble, because black suddenly has very, very serious uh, attack on the king's side. Rook d1, c takes d4. To black. Uh, knight d5, uh, this was the point of white playing uh, rook d1. If you take on d4, both uh, e4 and f4 are possible, but I think e4 was very likely what uh, what uh, Richard was planning here. Uh, this position is uh, not that clear, but I think uh, long term black has uh, a lot of trumps. Uh, he can go for, for instance, for a plan of h5, knight g6, and then later uh, try to play for f5, f4. Also, d6, d5 on the next move might be a very decent idea, uh, further strengthening the uh, the center. Uh, Pile played knight d5, and this is perhaps the first very, very critical moment of the game where, and also, I guess, the moment where Richard settled on a, a plan which was perhaps not the best. Uh, somewhat surprisingly, considering his style and the way he generally approaches chess, Instead of a very attractive move, bishop a6, which continues to offer uh, the exchange sacrifice, and white probably needs to accept it here. And in this position, uh, there is a number of moves black can make. Queen c6 is an interesting option. Queen c8, which also uh, creates a potential idea of a 5 of 4, because by placing it on c8, black uh, uh, gets the g4 pawn under control. After all of these moves, uh, the position is very, very unclear, and it's uh, it's very playable for black. Perhaps uh, black might even be <clears throat> better here. It was also possible just to play e4 here and take on e7 with the queen, <clears throat> making sure that the structure that uh, occurred in the game does not actually appear on the board. Let's say that takes d4, uh, and uh, you can play knight e5 here and you get a much better version of the same structure as in the game. You can also maybe uh, make an argument for knight takes d4, e takes d4, and something like bishop a6 here, trying to uh, challenge the white center straight away with an unclear position. But Richard played d3, which was connected with a very interesting uh, idea as well, but uh, an idea that uh, proved to be uh, less precise, and as mentioned, the beginning of his uh, troubles. 
queen d3, e4, knight e7. Now, unfortunately for black, he can no longer take on e7 with the queen because of queen d5 check. Knight takes e7. And here, <clears throat> it was possible to take on d6 because after the uh, uh, recapture and bishop e6, which I suspect was Richard's plan, white probably uh, is uh, in time to, to stabilize here by playing knight g4, rook g8 takes, takes, and bishop f1. And uh, black never really wants to take on g4 with a bishop, and he is not really in time to do anything else. White has a very simple plan, for instance, of a4 and a5. And it would appear that white would have some advantage here. But Pavel uh, approached this in a more structured fashion. He decided not to uh, trade the queens and to keep uh, uh, keep playing against the black weaknesses, uh, uh, assuming that he, uh, because of the weakened, uh, weakened black king side and the pawn on d6, which will become uh, a target once he finishes development, that he should be, um, uh, should always have uh, better long-term prospects. And it, it was proven to be correct, although I think uh, Richard was not uh, particularly precise with his move orders here. Bishop a6 is already maybe a slightly an unnecessary move because, uh, as you will see, uh, black will eventually put it back on b7, but it will, it will be uh, pretty much a wasted tempo to play bishop a6. Knight g4, this is a, an excellent piece. Uh, right now it's threatening knight e6, as you can see, but also all these arrows indicate very comfortable plans that White now has at his disposal. In particular, during the live commentary, I kept on insisting that a knight on d4 is knight is nice, but it will be particularly good once it gets transferred to f4. And we will see this theme later in the game. Also, White wants to play b3 and bishop b2, and the bishop on c1, which had no prospects for, for large portions of this game, will finally uh, find uh, find some play. Knight c6, I'm already not quite sure about this this move. Maybe it was better to try playing something like b5 to at least get uh, the a6 bishop in the game. But knight c6, knight e5 looks very, very normal and very attractive. Uh, aiming for knight g3, also in some positions aiming for knight f3 check. And here the move I mentioned earlier, knight e2, is very, very strong. The knight is uh, handed over to f4, which for instance, if black plays knight f3 check, you can even take and play knight f4. And because this knight is there, black never gets any play connected with f4 and queen h3. And the position uh, is frankly probably just strategically lost because there is no counterplay. And the bishop on a6 is so poor that white will just uh, be able to uh, crush his opponent on the queen side and in the center. Uh, therefore, knight of 3 check is not really uh, an option anymore. Knight of, uh, knight of four is, is coming against almost any move. And after knight g3, bishop g7, queen g7, uh, white has a wide variety of very pleasant options. And uh, uh, during the live broadcast, I was uh, uh, very heavily advocating for rook b1, but perhaps uh, the move Pavel made is also quite decent. My, my point, though, was that the knight really does belong only on f4, and there's really no reason to... Uh, move it away from uh, its uh, designated square. And it's also very worth uh, noting that white really does not want to uh, trade the knight on d3 for the knight on e2. I think uh, it's not that the knight on d3 is worth a rook, it's that the knight on f4 will be worth more than a rook. Therefore, white's plan here should be, in most cases, just to take on d3 straight away. And uh, because of that, I felt that uh, rook b1, preparing rook takes d3, was a very, very good move. And uh, we thought that bishop b7 is maybe the only choice black has. And then after uh, all the captures, you get a position very similar to the one uh, the players got in the game. But white will play a knight of four in one tempo and will not have to cycle the knight back. But the game continued knight g4, rook a8, rook bishop b7, takes, takes. And the knight went back to e2, uh, which is, uh, once again, sort of the, the point I was trying to make. White's position is so solid that the waste, well, waste is maybe a strong word, but the slight inefficiency in getting the knight to f4 perhaps doesn't really matter. But uh, I did feel that starting with rook b1 was maybe saving white half a tempo somewhere. The position is still uh, a lot better for white here, especially in practical play, because 
Black is struggling to find any kind of counterplay. The king on g8 is very, very weak, whereas the king on g1, uh, when the knight is on f4, feels completely safe. There are no pawn breaks available to black at all. So black really needs to just uh, patiently wait for white to improve, which is something that Richard probably wasn't very eager to do. And his position collapsed uh, a lot faster than it really should have done uh, in this position. Rook f6, knight f4, queen e4, queen g2, rook c8. Perhaps hoping for some counterplay with b5 followed by rook c2. But uh, Pavel controls this. Uh, he is in no hurry whatsoever. He plays a4. In some positions, a5 might become an idea, but mainly I think this, this does a very good job of controlling the potential pawn break. Rook c5, rook g1, queen f3. This already is sort of uh, sowing uh, the seeds of black's destruction, uh, destruction. But after knight g5, I guess the final mistake is playing rook f7. Something like rook e6 uh, may have been slightly better, but already black's position uh, looks very, very suspect because uh, the rook on c5, I don't think it, it, it ever should have been there. I think it's uh, black uh, should maybe have uh, aimed to keep that rook on e5. Uh, 1 on f6, 1 on e5. If white goes knight d5, you go rook f7. Although even that position would be really, really unpleasant to play in practical sense. But as it happened after, after rook f7, uh, Pavel played queen c2. And suddenly uh, it becomes uh, glaringly obvious that the queen on f3 is stuck. The very simple plan is rook d4 followed by rook f4, simply picking that queen up. And if you play queen e4 straight away, white just takes fe and goes rook d4. And the pawn on e4 falls and white will have two pawns and continued dominance all over the board. So that position has to be close to winning. But it probably was... Uh, uh, better than what uh, Richard opted uh, to do. He played a6, I guess with the idea of meeting, uh, sorry, knight takes b6 is what Pavel played, but after rook d4, uh, black plays b5, and uh, uh, the cruel machine suggests that after queen d3 there really is no defense against rook f4, and white is completely winning. Uh, but uh, currently rook f4 is impossible because of queen takes d5, so I guess Richard felt maybe a6 uh, creates some opportunities to uh, to play for tricks. But both rook d4 and knight takes b6, frankly, are just uh, totally winning for white. Queen e4, in this position, I was arguing during the live show for just taking, taking and playing b4, which should be objectively winning, but it might take a while. Instead, Pavel played queen c3, queen e5, rook d4, a5, queen d3, rook c6, knight d5. And White's position is is overwhelmingly uh, overwhelmingly uh, winning here. He will eventually start picking up all the weaknesses he can play here uh, against. And uh, uh, Richard played Nigeria, making sure that uh, uh, White controls all the squares. Rook f6, Rook d5. And in this position, uh, having made the time control, Richard, I guess, did not really spend too much time wondering because. Uh, everything collapses, the a5 pawn is gone, and then white will uh, have a pleasant choice of either continuing to attack the, the weaknesses on the king side, or just queening his uh, huge pawn majority on the queen side. So Richard just resigned here. Uh, the only decisive game uh, of the day in, in the Masters, there were a number of games which ended in, uh, in victories for uh, players in, in the challenges, but in the Masters, this is the only decisive game of the round. It has uh, been a, a reasonably quiet, uh, quiet round, but uh, I'm sure the action will pick up, and I'm sure Richard will continue to drive the action. I'm not. Uh, I'm, I'm very confident that uh, uh, the loss in the first round will not uh, make him play in a significantly different manner. He is. Uh, I think very, very consistent in in uh, going for as full-blooded a struggle as possible in every single game. And we will continue watching it with great interest and uh, we wish him well because I think without him this tournament uh, will be much the poorer. This uh, has been uh, Peter Swidler with the uh, highlight video of uh, round one of Tata Steel Vikings A 2017. Uh, thanks for watching.